Our next speaker is uh, Molly Brumbley. She's uh, from Walnut Springs Farms in Elkton, Maryland. She's going to talk about um, her experiences with high tunnel production of uh, sweet cherries. There's been certainly a lot of interest in high tunnels lately, and I was glad that uh, Molly agreed to come down and share some of, uh, some of what she's found out about it. So, so Molly? Okay. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I'm not a university person. I'm not a researcher. I'm just a grower who took a risk and tried to figure out how to make this work and see how it would fit in our operations. And um, um, hopefully, I've had a lot of phone calls. I get a lot of phone calls, I know, and he's not here today, but uh, Charlie Smith is putting up some high tunnels for cherries uh, down in Bridgeville. Um, I had a call yesterday from a guy who saw an article about this in Fruit Grower News um, from Quebec. So there's a lot of interest in high tunnels in general, but also now in some of these specialty crops and in field scale high tunnels. As you, as you can see, um, these aren't the high tunnels like you can get the little grant from the USDA from and that sort of thing. I mean, this is two acres under high tunnel field scale, drive your tractor through it, do your spraying through it and that sort of thing. Um, and a little bit of background, we are, Walnut Springs Farm is uh, just outside of Newark, Delaware in Cecil County, Maryland. Um, we are small fruit growers, uh, strawberry, we start the season with strawberries, um, we go into black raspberries, the red raspberries, blueberries. So, um, you know, this tree fruit was something totally, totally new to us. I'll figure out how to work this. Do I have to point it at it? Okay, why cherries? Um, really strong customer demand. We are entirely a pick your own operation. We have no farm markets, we don't have retail stands, so everybody comes to our farm to pick their fruit or to buy some things that we have already picked. And we got a lot of questions about cherries. Uh, we have a pretty good sized cherry grower who had done it for years, not too far from us, but they were somewhat dwarf some traditional trees. Uh, they harvested a crop, had a crop available about once every three years they would have a good, they would have a good crop. We had a lot of customers uh, wanting to know. Uh, we'd be at the end of strawberry season before the raspberries were ready. They'd come out, you know, they had their dates wrong. I mean, our customers just have no concept of when strawberries are ready. Um, so, we wanted something that would fill the gap in our existing harvest season when the strawberries were finishing and before the raspberries were getting started. Um, and cherry twe trees, dwarf cherry trees, are suited for pick your own. I mean, it's compared to picking strawberries where you're bending over and everything, the people love that. And it's something that you can charge a premium price. I'm, I'm a big proponent that we never charge what we should for our crops. And we've, you know, especially in Pick Your Own and even in your farm markets and your farm stands, the days of when, if you're buying it from a farmer, you're getting a bargain and you're getting a discount, those days are done because you just can't grow it and sell it for that. And most of the people we have found coming to the farm, they don't even really look at the price. For one thing, they're whipping out their plastic credit card and they don't even pay attention to what you're charging them. I, I tell you a funny story. I had somebody who didn't pick, um, you know, very many cherries, but her bill was um, like $60. I mean, so that was a fair amount. But she basically looked and she goes, oh, well, I have 10 pounds, $60 a pound. She had no clue. I mean, really, there's a lot of room you can work there with some of these crops that are going to cost you a lot more to grow. Oops. Okay, so why tunnels? Um, <coughs> main reasons, keep the trees healthier and keep the fruit dry. Eliminate or control some of those problems with growing cherry trees on the East Coast. Um, the old saying is, and one of the guys up at Cornell told me, cherry trees love to die. When I was saying I was going to go into this, I was told by, pardon, univer university experts, oh, you, 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 cherry trees, don't try them. You're going to lose 50% of them. They're going to die. You, the trees won't live. Um, so trying to first learn how to grow the trees and keep the trees alive. 
um, and in that reduce your bacterial canker, which is a big thing, um, and your various fungal infections that come from the moisture. Um, improve the fruit quality. The reason why most of the growers have problems with their cherry crop is the crop is, you have a beautiful crop, it's ready, it's ripe, and then you get a week of rain and the crop crap, cracks. It's a crappy cracking crop. Um, manage harvest and pick at desired ripeness. What happens when you have a forecasted weather event, um, your cherries are about ready to be harvested, but you have a forecast of rain, you're rushing to get them harvested before you lose them. So then they're not at maximum sweetness, they're not at maximum ripeness, they don't weigh as much. Um, so it, the goal is to allow them to hang on the tree until they uh, develop optimum, their bricks count, their sugar counts higher, and they have um, you know, the sweetness and the flavor that your customers want. Plus the customers can pick in the rain. You don't have to close for picking. Um, lower pesticide usage. I mean, that was something I've, I've played around with, um, but it is, it is true. I, I went over to, to England to see how some of the big commercial growers are doing it, um, and the people who manufacture the tunnels that I had, Haygrove, which are a big fruit farm in England, and these, this particular system was farmer developed. Um, they have cut their pesticide usage by over 50%, and they are also have big organic farms over there where they're growing the cherries organically. I haven't managed to figure out how to go that far yet, and it's not going to happen with SWD in them now. So, um, And bird protection, that's another thing. These covering of the orchard allows you to then net it as well, so we essentially have no bird damage. And I'll go through and show you how we do some of those things. Okay, my particular setup, and I'll just go through how I did this. Um, I have um, 84 foot wide by 900 feet long. This particular system has to be a three bay system for structural integrity. It's a three season tunnel, so it has no snow load rating. Um, and we're covering late March before bloom, and we're taking them off. Uh, we've done it as late as the end of September, and this past year we did it mid-August. Um, if you've got a hurricane predicted to come up the East Coast, you need to get your covers off. And it's amazing how quickly you can get them off when that's coming. And I'll show you damage pictures when you don't get them off. Um, uh, the Luminance Poly is a particular poly, and I know there's one other company um, out of Canada that's manufacturing it now. It's a particular poly, it's not greenhouse plastic. It's a particular poly that's meant to disperse the light, the UVA and the UVA, UVB light rays that uh, scatter that light through, uh, through the canopy of the tree, and they use it for all their fruits over in, in England. And um, Smart ends, that is the smart end. I went with uh, a few upgrades over what you might standard see on some of the tomato tunnels and things because mine are higher, they're longer, and for about $300 an end, I can get this additional bracing, which they call smart ends, which you can attach doors to if you want. Um, and it saved me. It saved me. There's one time when my tunnels probably would have gone down if I hadn't put extra wires, extra bracing on the side. Um, so you have to build them to withstand you know, the weather they're going to endure. Okay, so my tree, out, my tree layout, and again, this was, I planted my trees in 05 and 06. Um, and I would probably do some things different now, which I'll go over in the end, but I based my system off of what I had seen successfully done in Europe. I wasn't going to totally reinvent the wheel. Um, all on Gisela 5 rootstock, and I, I by mistake got some Gisela 6 rootstock, dwarfing rootstock from one of the nurseries, um, and those trees are just too big for what I did. I mean, they were Gisela 5 on Benton, and I mean, I mean Gisela 6 on Benton, and I mean, they just, they're all wood. So you need the dwarfing rootstock, and you need varieties that are not going to have a tendency to throw out really big wood. Um, six by eight spacing, and I have a diagram of that. Um, it's in a three row bed system. So, and I planted my trees and made sure I could keep my trees alive for a year 
before I put the steel over them. Um, if I did it again, or when I expand, I'll be putting the structure up before I plant the trees because it is a pain to put the structure up over two-year-old trees, but it was, uh, you know, I, I'd never grown a tree before. We have no, our farm has no orchard crops, so I had to make sure I could do the trees. So uh, the bed system, and essentially you have a tractor alley and you have three rows, and I have buried them. Um, so I did bury, um, because I knew they were going to be covered, so irrigation is, is critical. There's a row of drip tape buried on either side. So in each bay, there's six rows of drip tape, basically. Um, a lot of people said that was overkill. One of my reasons was the, the tape lying on top of the soil I knew was going to put that much more humidity into the air under the tunnels. Um, plus, I wanted... My root, I mean, my root establishment, my roots to grow down towards the water source as opposed to have a tendency to be shallow rooted. Um, and then I staked my trees, which I've since, since taken the stakes out. Um, doing all that, I really feel contributed to the livability, the survivability of my trees and their vigor because I had really good root establishment and um, I just feel the trees, uh, they did what they were supposed to do as far as um, going towards, towards the water. And you don't want all those tapes, those irrigation tapes lying on top of the ground if you're going to have customers coming through picking. Uh, that was my tree late I was talking about. So this is one bay of the tunnel. You have a 10-foot tractor alley and then you, it's kind of a diamond pattern. So within this, that would all be I, the same variety. I did about 25% pollinators and scattered them throughout. But uh, walking down through, you would walk in through here and be able to get on either side of the tree. And then this is the leg rows are on the side. Okay, so this was fall of 06. So these trees at this end are second leaf trees and the other end was just planted this spring and it had to do with I didn't plant them all at one time because right now there's about a two-year wait to get any quantity of trees on certain rootstocks from a lot of the nurseries so it was a timing thing but um, this was right before I put the tunnels up over them um, construction of the tunnel, we had to really improvise because of our bed system. We couldn't get in the middle. So it's, and uh, our farm operates, um, uh, we have no really full-time employees. We don't have a crew on hand. It's just family. Um, so rounding up the people to do this construction and every year when we skin, that's probably one of my biggest issues with doing something like that. This was just with the steel up in the fall. Um, and then in the spring, and this isn't two-year-old trees, this is a little later, but I had to go through. One thing when you're growing, you don't tend to take the pictures you need to take, like researchers might go out and take the pictures, so I really had to figure out what pictures I had. But I know there's a couple people who have asked me, you know, how do you actually get the plastic on? So you make these poles that you push it, that's about a... 18 foot apex up there at the top that you've got to get the plastic to and it's a 900 solid stretch of poly that we're pulling up there and skinning. So you've got it up the top um, and in the winter it's stored down in these gutters and covered with black plastic and I have a picture of that. Um, and then you're going through and unfolding it on either side and then they have an ingenious type of roping system um, that you use to hold it in place. Um, and it takes a while to learn the system, but once you learn it, um, it's, it really works very well. I mean, we have withstood 60, 75 mile an hour winds when it's been fully covered, which is what really scared me. Okay, so that's... Uh, those are probably those same trees. You know, there's not that much bloom because it's only the first or second time. Um, but um, fully covered, in other words, the poly is down into the gutters at either side. So this would be, we have no sides on them. So from a frost protection standpoint, there's no ends and there's no sides. But um, 
until last year when we actually had a freeze at bloom, we really haven't had any problems with frost. The one problem we had one year was in April 13th, I think it was, I went to one of these meetings or something. We were in full bloom and I left that morning. I went to Annapolis, beautiful tree. It got to like 85 degrees, like April the 12th. I came home the next morning. It was totally brown. The blooms just, you know, the heat had risen. We hadn't vented. I hadn't paid attention to what the weather was going to do, so. Okay, netting. Um, what the tunnel allows you to do for netting and bird protection, and it just works marvelously, um, is allows you to drape netting. There's little hooks there. You can see that uh, we've rolled the plastic, that hook onto the ropes that help you vent, that you can just unroll. Uh, we get the bird netting in like 5,000 foot rolls, and you just roll it out and then put it with, you know, hold it in place with sandbags. And these are the wires on the side that are anchored, there's anchors in the ground here for the structure that it just kind of drapes over and um, the birds, you know, I mean, they'll find a way to get in, they always find a way to get in and snakes get caught in it, but uh, as far as the birds coming in and really devastating your crop and, you know, pecking your cherries to death, it works well. Um, and you also are able then to net in this gap. This is the, what they call the gutter, the leg row, so you have trees here, trees here. The same thing, you can hook the netting on either side and it just lays in there and keeps the birds from coming in that gap. And as you vent the tunnels and you move it up as the season progresses, you can just move that netting right up along with it. Okay, so I went through this briefly. The timeline, I planted the trees, uh, 05, 06, built the tunnel the fall of 06, put the steel up, covered it for the first time in 08 and harvested my first crop covered it for the first time in 07 and harvested my first crop in 08. So those were the 05 trees getting a crop off of them in 08. So that's one of the things about cherry trees on dwarfing rootstock is the ability to get a third year harvest. It's not your, it's not your biggest harvest, but compared to traditional trees where you're waiting five, six, seven, seven years. Um, the biggest the hardest thing to do, again, other than it's a learning curve on the tunnels, is getting the trees to do what you want. And I know most of the questions I get are training the trees, getting enough lateral branch development, how do you do that? Um, and I had success, but I mean, I'm still modifying it. Uh, with the young trees, um, the goal was, because I'm maintaining them, oops, I'm maintaining them in a uh, small space was to get a tall skinny tree that had the laterals coming out as opposed to a Spanish bush type tree or anything that because I have to be able to move around them. So um, I was trying to keep the tree height at 10 to 12 feet, keep it in its space. I've now modified that and I don't want 12 foot trees. I want them 8 to 10 foot and that's as much for what I've learned about managing the humidity and the air circulation and spray coverage in that volume of air in the top of the tunnel. Um, flat branches, horizontal crotch angles for disease. I mean, I used, uh, for the training to get the lateral development, I used uh, the bud removal, which is something, um, you know, they talk about on the West Coast and Greg Lang with Michigan State does where you're taking, um, leaving just one bud, bud at the top, removing three, leaving one, removing three, because the buds no naturally grow on the tree in a circular pattern going down the tree. So by doing it every third bud, you get a circular pattern um, laterally around the tree. Um, crotch angles, I use clothespins when they were first starting. Um, I know a lot of people do when they get older, the little cups with the concrete in them kind of hanging down. Um, and I also did, uh, talking with a guy who did research out in Washington State on what they were doing, I did use uh, the promelin, the, the scoring with the promelin, um, and had real good success with that. I'm not sure whether that's labeled or not. I'm not a scientist, but it worked. Um, pruning. That is the most critical thing. Just tunnels aside with the trees. Most people don't have success with cherry trees, I've come to learn, is because they're growing a lot of different crops and they just don't have time to pay attention to what the cherry tree requires because you really 
can't send a crew of people in. Almost every tree has to be looked at individually. It's really hard if you go in with an apple pruning uh, peach mentality and send a crew through. It doesn't get done the way it's supposed to be done, which is another reason why they're looking at alternative types of training systems on trellises and that sort of thing to make it more mechanized for harvesting and pruning and more, you know, have more of a system. Um, summer pruning, do a lot of summer pruning. Um, it's, it's when you prune to manage the tree size, crop load management for the following year because your fruit buds are setting in the summer that will be your crop for the following year. Light management. Um, and the advantage of a tunnel is you're pruning undercover, so all your pruning wounds and everything are not getting wet, they're dry. So from a disease control standpoint, it helps you with the healthier tree. And then your dormant pruning is when you're trying to develop your fruiting wood renewal. The dormant pruning invigorates the tree. Um, we're trying to do about 25% a year. Um, keep to the rule of no laterals greater than half the diameter of your main leader, and then even though we're under cover, they are exposed from September through February. So when you're doing <clears throat> any of your cuts, summer or dormant, and I've been lucky, I've been able to do with cherries doing a delayed dormant pruning, I've been able to do that pruning under cover because if I get the covers up, so I'm also not getting those, those wounds wet. Um, we talked about this. Um, the biggest, one of the biggest things I've had to deal with is the trees filling in the space. They grow so vigorously under the tunnel, and actually they've shown, um, like Greg Lang from Michigan State came out and looked, and the leaf size on cherry leaves under tunnels are about 25% bigger than cherry trees outside. So you have a lot of vegetation. You really have to watch how much nitrogen you put on them and how much vegetative growth you get versus your fruit. Um, and you have to, my bed system had a tendency just kind of grow into a jungle, so I really had to do some pruning in the summer to take out branches where I didn't want them so that I got the light through there. But in about a three-year-old tree, that's kind of what you wanted, the branches around that has green, all my pictures basically have green fruit on because the time we got to harvest, I stopped, forgot to take pictures. Um, but that's summer of 07, so those are two-year-old trees that are already kind of starting to crowd each other. Um, uh, that's a fall picture, um, and one thing, listening to Carrie's uh, talk on, that's your name, right? Yeah. Uh, on, on the floor and the litter management, um, we do go through and uh, get those leaves out of there before it warms up in the spring to, uh, to try and maintain the disease. Because you still, even though you're under a tunnel, you still have a lot of humidity. You just don't get rid of that. You just don't have the direct moisture on the trees. Um, that's a bloom picture. People ask how we spray. The spraying works pretty well. If you take your tractor down here, we have a three-point hitch uh, air blast sprayer on the back of the tractor. And so even when the covers are down, and this is as low as they'll be because after bloom, we move it up about that length. You can spray out both sides. You just set your volutes so that this is hitting this a little better there and adjust you know, your air volume and everything. And then you can also spray. Your legs are high enough that you can get the spray to go up. And the fact that you have a cover kind of traps the spray and it settles down on top so you don't have to worry about the drift and we've we've the rates can definitely be reduced uh, we use bumblebees for pollination we bring in the quads from copperts um, they seem to work really well um, the bumblebees work under tunnels their navigation system is different than a um, a honeybee in that uh, the tunnels don't mess up their navigation. They'll work when it's windier and colder. Um, and they don't have to return to their hive every night, I've been told. Um, and then we take them out and we stick them in the strawberries and the blueberries and the raspberries and they last about 12 weeks. That's what you want. I mean, they're not ripe yet, but that's kind of what you want. Um, like I say, we're... The customers love it. I mean, this tree's a little on the small side, but again, the pick your own. We pick in um, buckets with the plastic liners in them, and then they just pull it out and we weigh it. Oh, 
Okay, the money. Everybody asks about the money, okay? Um, and I, my tunnel cost $55,000, basically. Now, and that was at about 70 cents a square foot at the time. I made some additions onto it. Um, but right now, the last time I asked the Haygrove guys, if you get all the bells and whistles, um, you're going to be at about a dollar a square foot. And I'm right at uh, close to 80,000 square feet. Um, so probably my same tunnel is going to be closer to $75,000 now. I mean, when I bought mine, I tracked the exchange rate because they're coming from Europe. I tracked the exchange rate and, you know, that sort of thing. And sometimes they offer discounts. But the trees, um, a lot of the trees had, I don't know the right terminology, they were patented or registered or whatever, so you had to pay a premium on them. Um, but about $12 a tree planted and staked. Um, now that doesn't count site prep, the irrigation, um, the labor to get the tunnels up, the labors to skin them every year, that sort of thing. That's just the establishment, the base establishment cost. Um, yield. When I started, the stuff that came out from Oregon State and Washington State, and um, you know, they said, oh, some of these trees, and some of them, some of the Regina and the Lapins, they were saying, oh, 40 to 50 pounds per tree. Well, that's a tree that you're letting get, even though it's on dwarfing root side, it's getting pretty big, and those are some varieties that really, really heavily set. I would say, I'm hoping to get like 20 pounds to 25 would be my goal, but on average, I'm going to get about 15 pounds per tree. I planted almost a thousand trees. I've taken probably a hundred of them out just because of spacing issues. I, re I really didn't have any tree disease. I lost no trees to disease, but trees that just didn't branch right or just uh, getting my middle row, I took a bunch of them out for spray coverage. Um, so you figure 800 trees, and you might want to, you know, not every tree produces like it should every year. Um, but if you just multiply that out, uh, 12,000 pounds. Um, and I use 350 a pound because our typical price is 399 a pound is what people are paying. It goes down if you pick over 30 pounds. And it goes up to $4.99 a pound if you pick less than five pounds. So the gap between five pounds and 30 pounds is $3.99. So that might be a little bit on the low side. So the potential for maximizing production on a small amount of acreage is there. Um, and that was one of the goals with our operation, um, is that we don't want to grow anything that you can't get at least $10,000 an acre off of. Um, we're dealing on small acreage, um, and we had to take basically two and a half acres of prime strawberry production ground out to, to, on this site. This was the best site on the farm, which is why the frost isn't really an issue. Um, the tunnels are oriented east-west into the prevailing wind, not the typical orchard north-south. Um, this is a fall picture after harvest. Uh, that bay with it, with it fully skinned, and then when we've taken it off. And one of the reasons to take it off is to get the light into it for that fruit bud set. Um, and then for the winter, basically the poly remains in that gutter and it gets covered with the black plastic, which we just use the plastic, same plastic we use for strawberry beds. Um, and that helps the UV light not to degrade the plastic over the winter from the harsh winter suns and snow glare and that sort of thing. Um, the challenges. Um, and Kim, those strawberries look nice, don't they? Um, unpredictable weather. It doesn't matter what you do. The weather is going to get you and you just can't control it. Um, lateral development on the trees. Um, controlling tree size spray coverage and temperature and humidity control. Um, spray coverage has been a challenge. I tried to really cut back on the rates one year, and of course that was the year where it got to be 95 degrees when they were ripe and it was humid and I got whatever little brown rot was hanging around decided to show up. Um, 
Yep. That's what you don't want the customer seeing when you, when you come in. And that's actually not brown rot. What is that? It's like anthracnose on cherries. But no, what is, what is gray mold called? What's the other word for? Botrytis, that's what I meant. That's botrytis on cherries, which isn't common, but, uh, but shows up. And that's what we had a bad infection of one year. Um, this, this is, uh, actually it's the same year. But what happened this year that I'm not exactly sure. One of the problems was is that, I don't know what the official term is for the little dried petals, they never fell off. They like, even with spraying and everything, and I think a lot of that inoculum that was in there just hung around there, and then we had that 90 degree temperature, and I mean, that's what happened. Um, and I don't know whether it was because the, you didn't get enough air flow through there, they just didn't dro drop off. So if anybody knows what might have caused that, I'm open to ideas. Um, <coughs> insect problems. Um, we have had some mites and some aphids, um, but it's, it's localized in certain areas. And when we see it, the best thing we did was cut it and just put it in garbage bags and take it out of the orchard. I mean, that was what seemed to work. OK, uh, the other thing is damage to your structure. And this is the biggest risk to any of these structures is when you get three inches of rain in an hour of time and you don't get up there. Um, and this is, a, this is a small, this is one I happen to have a picture of. This is a small bubble. But very rapidly, if you have slack in your covering, you can develop these giant bubbles that then do that. And when they do that and you're covered, it also then hits your steel and bends it sideways. Um, it does that. Okay. That was a hurricane that was coming up quickly that they were predicting really high winds, but they really didn't talk about how much rain. And we didn't get the high winds, but we got like three inches of rain in an hour. And we had vented uh, for the winds. We had really uh, pushed the poly up and the, the water has pulled it down. Put, and it made some of those accordion pleats and caught water. And, um, but it was, it's, w one thing about it was it was relatively easy to go in and pull out a couple legs and pop a couple hoops off while the plastic is up there and um, repair the structure. Because this, this was the beginning of September. Um, so the positive, um, customers love the tunnels. Uh, the, un, the added benefit to this, which we didn't anticipate, was how much positive reaction we would get from the customers. It's something different. They like the crop. The kids love going in there. Um, they think we're doing something special for them. They think we're growing organically. They um, I mean, if someone asks me, I'm going to tell them what we're doing. But, you know, they hear on the press about tunnels and buy local and all this. And so they really reacted well to the price versus the benefit and the quality of the fruit. And, and the quality of the fruit um, when you have a good year is just fabulous. I mean, I'm talking um, eight row cherries, which, I mean, we had humongous cherries. Um, willing to pay a premium price, picking in the rain, no cracking. The only cracking we get, I think, comes from humidity and actually if it, it, we, we have to work out our irrigation schedule. And uh, there was a speaker at Hershey this year that talked about some studies they're doing in Michigan. Uh, sometimes throwing the water to them quickly when it's really hot and dry, you know, I think sometimes that can actually cause them to... Uh, to crack. Um, early harvest. We have been, we've beat the competition by a week to 10 days every year since we've started, and that has been a big bonus. I mean, I didn't put these up to do a season extension. I don't really want to come into bloom any earlier because of the weather risk with that, um, but, but so hastening the season, I would have to say. But then also, being able, if the weather looks bad, to not have to open sooner than I want to because the crop's not ready. 
the trees are healthier, you can prune under cover and use lower spray rates. Frost protection, I'm still questionable on because this year we got hurt by frost. We, we lost at least 25, if not closer to 50% of our crop. We had frost, frost freeze, and they were in bloom, and the self-pollinating trees did real well. Um, I think the bees didn't work as well. It was just kind of a messed up season um, all the way around with all our crops. Um, and then I think it threw the insects off, and it was just, you know, there's always, that's one thing about farming, there's always next year, right? And this time of year, you always start to get positive. Um, so I think that's, okay, changes for next time. Fewer trees. I probably would go with fewer trees and let them get bigger. So I still had the same amount of fruiting wood, but just maybe a little easier to manage. I might do two rows where I drive the tractor down the middle, um, cover at the beginning only because now I know how to grow the tree. Um, the UFO uh, training system is upright fruiting offshoot training system. It's like a hedge type system that they're using where they plant the tree and they bend it and they, they work with the, uh, the apical tendency of the tree to grow upright so your branches are growing upright and they trellis them. Of course, then you have wires in there and you know, it's, there's trade-offs for everything. Um, shorter tunnels, um, I was at the mercy of what land I was able to rent from my da oops. dad out of <laughs> strawberry production. I don't, um, so I went 900 feet long. I would probably do six bays and do like 500 feet uh, long because that's just a lot of poly to fool with. I mean, if I need to have a video camera and get pictures of human parachutes when we're putting that thing up. When you're skinning them, you're doing it as soon as light breaks at 5.30 in the morning, and you might only get one done that morning before the wind picks up. Um, any questions while I'm getting to the end here? I know everybody's hungry. Yes? Um, is it necessary to paint the trunks white? I did that for um, when they were young uh, for protection from what I would call like snow scald when they're very thin, you know, from that glare and also it inhibits um, when you're first, if you noticed on the bays I have in there, I have a bare dirt bed system. So I did use a fair amount of herbicides to get that established. So that kind of protected from any overspray on the trunks of the trees. Um, it also, uh, and once that was established with my system, I really don't have a weed problem in there because you're not disturbing the soil every year. I love Chateau. So that's something for, to think about, um, and we don't use Roundup in there. Um, side curtains, that's the other thing. A lot of people do put side curtains on their tunnels, and I know the vegetable growers and everybody do. Um, I just didn't fool with it. I don't, you know, I might go to it with a smaller tunnel with a different type of crop, but I think with cherry tree versus a low-growing fruit, I don't think it would be that much, that much of a benefit. Yes? Do you have any uh, <coughs> uh, high capacity fans just to keep air circulation moving around? No. No. I mean, like I say, we built them east to west, which is our prevailing wind. Um, and the only time we have issues are on those, that's usually right at harvest, are on the 90 to 100 degree days where it's high humidity and there's no air moving. But by that time, these are fully vented up. So you're, you're getting a fair amount of air going through. The biggest thing that inhibits that is the number of trees and all that foliage and everything you have in there. So yes? You had, you had issues with gray mold in there um, on the fruit. What, what about brown rot? Um, we had some brown rot when I let the trees the first couple years at the tops of the trees when they got like 12 foot tall. Um, like I say, I've been trying to do very limited rates of spray, but I ramped up my fungicide spray, 
and that seemed to control it. And I also took out the tops of the trees and limited the height. For one thing, the people can't pick them. I don't want anybody on ladders. And we realized even us getting in there on step ladders, picking the fruit that was up there, then to sell already picked was not cost effective. So I just eliminated the tops of the trees. And it seemed to, just that additional air circulation in there seemed to solve that, plus getting spray on with the right timing at bloom when that inoculum's going to get in there. Yeah, I think sanitation, I think keeping up with the and we take every single mummy cherry out of the orchard. That's something that eight and nine-year-olds can do. You put gloves on them, you put a hat on them, and you send them through, and they just... Um, and yeah, getting getting the mummies out, but that's usually that's a, that's usually not a problem because we literally don't have enough cherries for all the customers that want them. So if it's not rotten, the cherries are gone. Um, guy, would you do it again? <laughs> um, if I was 20 years younger, yeah. No, I I really it's been a lot of fun, but it's a lot of hard work. Um, I really like working with the trees. It fits our operation very, very well. Um, right now, from a, a money standpoint, um, I mean, this was a case where um, I basically borrowed all the money. I didn't have, I mean, I borrowed all the money to do it. So it had, you know, and you've got three years there before you get your money back. Um, so the two really good years I've had have shown me what the potential is, but then there's been a couple years where it doesn't work so well. So, you know, that's kind of the same way of growing them outside of tunnels, except that the comparison I have is some of the other cherry growers have had, out of the past five years, have only really had a crop two years. I've had a crop every single year. So my customers have at least if they pay attention and they get there, you know, it's a difference of, does my crop last five days? Does, does it last 15 days? Um, I would do it, I would do it again. Um, and I might, I might expand on this a little bit. Um, but basically, I do it all. So something in our whole family farm structure would have to change. And whether I want to, you know, expand on it, I'm not sure. Yeah, would I do it again? I, I would only because there's been other benefits to it other than just um, paying the bills, you know, family involvement and that sort of thing. And all these great fruit growers I've gotten to know in the orchard industry and, you know, the societies and going to meetings and things like that and continuing the family farm and, you know. Yes? What is the life expectancy of your tree? That's a good question because... I, the first trees on Gisela 5 rootstock, uh, basically in the United States, uh, I know there's a guy, Singer Farms, up in New York that has some that he planted in the early 90s. I mean, I've been told, you know, they, if the renewal pruning and the nutrition, everything is done right, I mean, they should be 25 to 30 year trees for production, just like other cherry trees. And your biggest advantage is you've gotten away from some of the bacterial diseases and the other diseases because you've got it covered. Right. I mean, keeping the trees healthy and dry, um, you know, and then you have to adjust. It's like, you know, the stuff you read in the university publications and everything, even, even um, uh, from soil tests and just spray <coughs> rates, I mean, you kind of have to make it as you go because there's really nothing to compare it to. But you can't, I, I still don't, it's very difficult to do it organic. Okay, SWD. I mean, I, we did IPM, um, and, but I'm spraying on a schedule everything on the farm this year. I mean, that's just the way it's going to be, because we had SWD in the raspberries. Um, I had plum curculio in the cherries this year. Um, you know, the black raspberries, we didn't have them this year, but, you know, what, now, that, now that it's on the farm, you know, who knows, and, and strawberries. Um, so it's very difficult. The, the, the advantage is, is that maybe you can do lower rates and you, don't ha you can control the spray, you don't have the drift and that sort of thing. Okay, thank you. Thank you.